Hey guys, it's Crystal from Sober Onions. I'm really excited here. I have John uh, as a special guest here. We're here in Ventura, California, and we're doing a recording for you. And um, I want to say hi, John. Hi, how are you, everyone? All right. Well, awesome. Well, we are here today and we're just going to talk about John's journey. And so I'm going to ask you some questions, John. I just want to learn a little bit more about you. So sure. go ahead and tell me who you are, where you're from, how long you've been sober, and uh, just give me a little, little bit about you. And then I'll ask you some more questions. Sounds good. Uh, my name is John. I just changed my last name to Wynn because I have um, a very long last name and my sister's running amok out there, still homeless after seven years. Um, I've lived in Ventura County since I was 20. I moved up here from the San Fernando Valley, just kind of on a whim, came out, saw some nice condos and the surf was great. So I've been in Ventura for 40 years or actually 45. I'm 65. Uh, and uh, or prefer old school, but uh, <laughs> anyway, um, as far as my sobriety, my home group used to be the Peninsula group at the boathouse there in uh, off of Peninsula. Uh, today, my home group is the uh, Saturday in the Park, which is every Saturday. I'll do a little plug every Saturday at nine o'clock at uh, Plaza Park, not to be confused with the one in Oxnard. It's actually right there across from the post office where the Cannon is. Somebody told me it's called Cannon Park sometimes, and that's my home group. As far as my length of sobriety, uh, it's been the roughest 23 years of my life, but I have 10 years sober. And quite honestly, what it took was uh, both really good county lockup for an extended period of time and waking up at uh, Jamestown where um, I was on an upper bunk and where they actually place all the firefighters. That was my job. So a lot of these firefighters originally were placed by me, but that was um, my, um, quite honestly, my, my moment of clarity, so to speak. So um, hopefully it covers all the things you've asked. <laughs> so you're a firefighter, retired firefighter? Or you... No, I'm, I'm, um, I was in engineering for the first uh, about 15 years of my life. Then I opened a real estate business uh, primarily because I just didn't like working for other people. Um, I owned a company called Pacific Coast Realtors mm -hmm. uh, right there on Johnson across from HD Supplies. Which, interestingly okay. enough, is the guy who bailed me out of jail. Bail Bond 101 is in my office as we speak. So there's some uh, ironic twist to life. Bail Bond's when that bailed me out and has probably about 100000 of my money is sitting in my old office, which was my... So I worked in real estate for 20 years, and we sold um, a lot of properties in West Ventura County. Okay. So tell me a little bit about you when you were not sober and how your life became unmanageable. And obviously you said you went to jail. So tell me a little bit about that. Um, you know, I'm not big on telling drunk logs at meetings <clears throat> only because I think sometimes people laugh at them and don't really understand satire. Um, quite honestly, I've, I, um, I actually am remodeling a house that I was drunk in quite often. And I hired a contractor and said, here's a blank check. And the guy milked it for about four months. My point is in that house, I had woken up one night on the 4th of July trying to figure out if those were gunshots. I was, uh, my MO originally, um, a little bit of history. I had a family of three, of two other people, two children and my wife, they are all dead. My father, uh, my son, Kyle, and his mother died in the car accident in 2003 uh, off of Mills Road. Um, they got in an argument about him living with me. She was marrying a sheriff's uh, father. He didn't wanna live with the guy. He pulled the steering wheel, they crashed on August 15th of 2003 and killed him 16 and his mother, Sandra. Uh, my other son, Taylor, who just happened to not be in the vehicle, he was at Boy Scout camp up in Pine Mountain. Um, at exactly that moment, I have a ribbon sitting outside in the yard, and Taylor came home to find out his brother and his mama dead, were dead. Uh, unfortunately, I kept on drinking and tried to be a single father while um, taking care of this kid who now no longer had a brother and a mother, 
And uh, um, I ended up back in jail. While I was in jail, unfortunately, my son contracted a little cyst in the back of his ankle. He was working at CVS. He was the youngest pharmacist in California history at the age of 18. And pharmacy assistant, excuse me. And uh, bottom line is that that cyst uh, turned into the size of a tangerine and it became sarcoma cancer. And on August 15th, the exact date his brother's mother died in 2009, he died at the age of 19. Wow. So the house that I go to or that I spent last weekend, three days of it, we're remodeling it to be a vacation rental. It is now kind of a cliquish neighborhood over there by Channel Islands Marina and the Keys. And, uh, but I, at first, I didn't really want to have anything to do with it. It's been rented for seven years. And now uh, going back to it, um, there's a lot of very mixed emotions. So if, to the people that are new, if you go on an emotional roller coaster ride, it doesn't mean it's wrong. It doesn't mean it's bad. It's just supposed to happen. In other words, I never grieved drunk. And now I'm having to deal with little memories, you know, um, things that um, that I'm remembering from when I raised my family in that home. So, but my drinking was very progressive. I ended up working in engineering and I also took, my wife quit working after the birth of our second son, Taylor. Kyle and Taylor were my two sons. And uh, I started working in real estate at night and uh, started doing escrow files while they were asleep or going to sleep. Um, drinking gin and tonics, which turned into tumblers of gin and tonics. And instead of coming to bed uh, to go to sleep, I came to bed and passed out. Um, my illness progressed. And so if you're new here, uh, don't think there's absolutely anything. I shouldn't say anything, but there's very little that can't be forgiven. And there's very little that people haven't done. Um, you know, I'm, I just remodeled the garage that I remember taking off for family trips. I had my Snapple and said, hey, I forgot something inside, would run inside, would empty the Snapple in the sink, pour a bottle of vodka, pour just enough Snapple, or leave just enough Snapple, get in the car and drive my family. That was my MO. My, my vodka was in the dog food in the garage, and I made a lot of trips out there. And uh, it progressed and progressed and progressed. So when they say it's progressive disease, it definitely is. And um, whether we see it or not, I don't know. You know, that really becomes, you know, and if people are new, that lightning that's supposed to hit us isn't really in the form of lightning. It's, and so we have to be receptive enough to, to, to be the, the receiver of the message because it may not come in the form that we're taught by some of these old timers. Um, hope that's that answers. Wow. I mean, so when you lost your, your, the kid's mom and both your sons, you were still drinking. And so you were never able to really mourn them. How did, did it cause you to drink more? Do you feel? Um, I went into custody in 2012 uh, after fighting uh, my, believe it or not, 11th DUI. <laughs> <Wow>. <laughs> um, the, the magic or the, the blessing, if people want to look at the silver lining of somebody drinking, and having a silver lining is in those 11 DUIs, non -word, none were, they were all non-accident, non-injury. So in other words, I never, because had I killed, say, for example, that person that killed the sheriff coming back to his car drunk driving, um, he's got 15 to life. He was out free for a year, went to a meeting every single day, 100 letters to tell what a great guy he was, got 15 to life. Had I hurt somebody drunk driving, there's no question in my mind that I would not be sitting here speaking to you as a free man. So if you're new and you're thinking, well, I have this fine or I have this. And part of the reason, quite honestly, and probably need to cr cr clarify that, Crystal, my attempt at control drinking, I'm a huge Costco guy. 20 years a member. They've actually called a cab one time. I was so drunk at Costco, the managers. Uh, they... Uh, but my point is that I've been a member for 28 years and I've never, ever once purchased their Grey Goose or any alcohol at their, their store. And the reason is because same reason I was good at real estate is what also made me an extremely scary and dangerous alcoholic, which is that if I got that four gallon bottle or two gallon bottle, whatever they come in of the Costco Grey Goose, 
I would drink it till I was a 0.7 on the carpet and would have died. So the point is my, my attempt at control drinking was I switched from gin to vodka, which all alcoholics do near the end. It's cheaper. Supposedly people can't quote unquote smell it. And, uh, but I would go before they had Grubhub or Grizzly or delivery, I would drive to the liquor store every two hours, four times a day. My drinking became a fifth of vodka a day, which is four half pints. By about the third and getting the fourth half pint, I was not in good shape. So the DUIs were primarily me going in my car rather than walking to the liquor, to the liquor store, store four times a day. Yes. Um, so, but anyway, that's. So how did you, so you've been sober for 10 years. So what, what was the end all be all that you were like, enough is enough. And I need to be sober and stay sober. Like it's, there, it's no there, longer. There, there's several of them, but I'll tell you that two things is when I was, I was, uh, unfortunately, I, I'm actually the only person that's taken Ventura County to the California Supreme Court and, and won. And uh, the point is they legally sentenced to me and uh, I was stuck there. And the, the, when P, I, I'm a big believer in Robert Downey Jr. Cause he basically, you know, went from his, and for those of you who don't know, he's an actor that had woken up in someone else's children's bed in, in the Malibu colony. He was a very good actor. He, anyway, my point is he went to LA County jail they didn't let him out. He went to um, uh, Cry Help in the Valley, which is a boot camp, theoretically, for recovery homes. And then he ended up doing prison time. And he said it was the best thing, the thing that could have ever happened to him. I got to, um, I did quite a few stints for violations of probations at Wasco. But each time it was like, look what they're doing to me. Um, I did time in county. I did, uh, and unfortunately, my very last one was at a place called Jamestown, which is where the firefighters come through. And um, the two things that saved my life there, or basically got did what the, the Peninsula Group couldn't do, what people telling me what I'm doing with my life couldn't do, even the death of my firstborn and his mom couldn't do was it gave me the time, the luxury of time to stop and get around other people who, for example, I was doing a lot of legal work and some of the guys were doing some serious time and they couldn't remember their crime because they were so drunk. And I'm going, can you imagine being in custody for a crime you can't remember? That's not, doesn't make you a criminal, but you can't remember the crime. And sometimes they were very serious. And so, for example, one of the things that I tell my guys and I sponsor them is the first person you put on your four step list, your resentment, and the first person you put on your amends list, your forgiveness, number nine, is yourself. And so I happened to be at Jamestown and they had an excellent, excellent library. And so, for example, three books I would highly recommend to newcomers. One is called Man's Search for Meaning by Viktor Frankl. Victor Frankl survived the Holocaust. He was a middle-aged guy, just like Freud or Jung, Carl Jung or Freud. But he believed in a thing called logarithm, where you take negative events and you end up making them, rather than making them your shackles, you make them your armor. And so Victor Frankl, when he was in the concentration camp, survived because he was a doctor, not a medical doctor, but a psychiatrist. But instead of whining and complaining and, and writing what you wrote this book is actually a very uplifting very short book but he says you you can live with any condition as long as you have a why that is his thing you have to have a purpose for putting up with all the crap that you stuff we put up with and so the reality is that he realized there were people in the camp that were like conditions that would have killed anyone else. They were basically starving. They were working them to death, but they wanted to see their wife at another camp and they thought she was alive. And the minute they found out their wife was dead, they would die within two or three months. And so Frankel taught me that right now I'm opening a bed and breakfast called Kyle's Corner Retreat and Wellness Resort. I'm speaking to you from it. We're designing the card in Pakistan right now. We just got done with the logo. It's a six bedroom, so cool. four bath house. That's and so, so awesome. what we're trying to do is to honor my sons. And so every day today, my why 
is my sons aren't here, but they'd be proud of their dad if he was, instead of the shame of the county drunk. The other thing that happened, Crystal, was uh, I was getting the Ventura newspaper. That's why I know about the kid that killed the sheriff on the, on the 101. Um, and I was following stories. It just was kept me because it is up in Northern California. And so a friend of mine, a guy named Paul Barton, that was in the program, died of cancer. And Paul was the nicest guy you can imagine. He had been NATO Navy, uh, petty crew, blah, blah, blah. And, and I thought, you know, you're kind of a scumbag. You're, you know, you're, you're whatever, manipulator slash whatever. And the reality is Paul was a great guy and he died and you're alive. And so that actually kind of gave me that, you know, maybe he's keeping you here for a reason or God's keeping you here for a reason. And the third, talking about the forgiveness is I was doing a lot of legal work for people that were really very un, un nice people. I mean, child molesters are not good, nice people. They put them in special yards, et cetera. But there was a guy there and I was in a Christian dorm and Steve was from San Ramon and played the guitar, long haired hippie guy. And um, he was he was very involved in our Christian group or in the Christian group. I'm, I'm more of a Buddhist. That was the other thing that a great Buddhist group there. And I would highly recommend Buddhism to anybody. There, very, there are a lot of similarities between 12 steps and Buddhism. But anyway, Steve uh, was in my dorm and one day I wouldn't involve in his legal work, but I used to see him go get his meds. But he was a very nice guy. And I said to him, Steve, you don't seem like a criminal. You don't even seem like a drug addict. What are you doing here? And he said to me, well, John, I lived in San Ramon. I ran a head shop, kind of like Salsers, and um, just was really happy. And uh, what ended up happening is I kept hearing about people doing meth and meth and meth. And so I guess at one point, him and his girlfriend tried meth. And they tried it for almost four days and four nights straight. And according to Steve, uh he they came obviously you know came back to normal they were starving he decided to go get some food and got in his car sober but very very tired and while he was driving he fell asleep crashed his car and killed two people and they had sentenced him to 20 years when you have a violent crime you do 85 percent of the time so he was going to die in jail for a very very bad decision that really was not a criminal intent, but bottom line is he fell asleep at the wheel. But the reason I, I bring Steve up is because I watched Steve live a very normal life around me and go get his medication every day. And he was a very positive guy. And I thought one day I couldn't forgive myself for my son's deaths. I couldn't, you know, uh, Kyle with his mom and then Taylor maybe not having been there for him. And the reality is I thought if Steve can kill two people, you can forgive yourself, John. He's forgiven himself because it was an accident. And so I think that's one of the things that's really, those were three factors that led to my recovery was one, just realizing that somebody who was a good guy died. Number two, having access to some phenomenal live books. And that's the thing that jail offers us that, that we don't get out there. I don't think I've read a book since 2014 all the way through. That's when I came, <laughs> came home, Crystal. But I used to read, I didn't just read books when I was in jail because there's so much politics and stuff going on. I would just get into them. So I read Steve Jobs' biography and realized that one of the greatest inventors in mankind, the one written by Erickson, was a total a-hole. He was just a really not a nice man. But I thought, you know what? This guy's a genius. So I also made me realize, you know what, John? Not everybody that's in AA is a great guy. Not everybody that you're going to talk to is going to be a nice person. And I, it really helped me to differentiate between Bill and Bob and the 12 mm -hmm. Steps right. and people in the program. I've met a lot of people in the program that don't walk the walk, don't talk to talk. And so if I tell newcomers, I tell them, look, there are people that are hypocrites. There are guys who chase girls and 13 step them and they'll tell you how spiritual they are. Mm -hmm. That's not Bill and Bob. And so um, another book that I would highly recommend to anyone who's new that I did read in jail and I really amazed is that Dr. Bob, the co-founder of Alcoholics Anonymous, it's called Dr. Bob and the Good Old Timers. 
And um, and I'll end it with this, but the the very end, the very first conclusion they ever had of Alcoholics Anonymous, what happened is that, it, that's also, if you're into history, a great book, is that Bob was dying of cancer, misdiagnosed cancer. And that's how nice a guy he was, is people wanted him to be pissed off at the doctor. And he was a doctor himself. He was a proctologist in Akron, where the... the he was founded. And he said, you know, it's an honest mistake. Anybody could have made it, but he was dying of cancer. And the reality is they said, we need to have a convention because New York is trying to steal our program. They're saying we're in New York, we're a big time, blah, blah, blah. And Akron is just, you know. And so they had the very first convention in a, in a, in a gymnasium there. And Bob on his way up turns to Bill Wilson and he says, Bill, don't let them F this up. Don't let them screw Alcoholics Anonymous up. It's never one alcoholic talking down to another alcoholic. It's always one alcoholic talking to another alcoholic. And, um, and he went up there, said one person, one vote. I don't care if you have five years or if you got one day, if you're at a convention and you're voting, you have. So if you're new, the good news is hopefully you stay. The second bit of good news is you have just as much power as a guy who has 30 years. And that is why I stay in AA, Crystal, because I've never met anywhere where you don't need, to, you know, the only requirements, the desire to stop drinking. As long as you have that desire, you're always welcome through the door. Number two, a guy who's got 30 years has no more say so in a meeting than you do with one day or one week or one month. And that's a beautiful, I love that because you don't find that anywhere in corporate America. So the point is, is that uh, um, that book had a really an, an impact on understanding these two men and how different they were, stockbroker and a proctologist, <laughs> yet they founded one of the greatest programs, in my opinion, and it, it, it segued into my Buddhism and uh, so... Hopefully that's, that's incredible. Yeah, no, it's incredible. It's encouraging. It's, it's an incredible story. I mean, you've come a long way. I mean, wow. And then I'm going to put, I'll put in the show notes, all the books that you mentioned and um, definitely about your son's uh, house that took, can you tell me a little more about that? Um, what you're doing for the, you're calling it Kyle's house? Is that what it's called? No, it's called Kyle's Corner Retreat. Kyle's and Corner well, Retreat. And wellness Resort. Uh, it's in the North End by the collection across the freeway from collection. It's a six bedroom, four bath house. And uh, we were in the process of making it to a, an aftercare. I went to Passages and Cliffside and uh, talk to them about these guys that come out of these high-end recovery homes because I, I've been in about 20. <laughs> I've been <laughs> from Betty Ford to Sullivan House from, from, you know, and the problem is that you're in a very artificial environment. And so when you get back outside in the real world, as the problems start to accumulate, so does the stress. And so what I was going to do is to have a house for people as they left, um, recovery uh, treatment centers, um, higher end, in other words, not four bunks to a room type of thing. Right. Um, right. But so we've actually gone away from that idea. My girlfriend was not crazy about it. <laughs> so what we're doing is that we're doing vacation rental, but I'm just reading on the branding. We're trying to sell t-shirts to say Kyle's Corner. And in our logo, we put the, uh, the date that Kyle and, Lisa and, and Sandra died. Uh, which is August 15th of 2003. It's right below the palm tree. And part of it is that in reading a lot about branding, a big part of it is a story behind it. And so rather than just doing a vacation rental by owner or Airbnb, we're going to say, let us tell you the history of who Kyle is. Mm -hmm. So if you go to my Facebook site, there's a picture of Kyle saying, get vaccinated. Um, you know, when we we're doing the Dallas Cowboys, he was a cowboy fan. And my point is, that's how my one of my sons lives, um, and uh, we're remodeling the other house. And it's Kyle. And actually, if you'd like to go on our website, uh, which was the original recovery home, mm -hmm. it's Kyle's Corner with a K, lowercase, mm -hmm. retreat.com. So, and is it, is it for men or it's men and women? 
Well, right now we're we're not going to do the recovery portion. We're doing the vacation rental. Okay, gotcha. So, okay. But um, part of it, to be honest with you, is the politics of it. Uh, it's sure. Political, even the NAA. The yeah. second part is that, um, as I said, I have a sister who's still homeless out there. She called me from a motel room asking for money recently. And my point is, is that I'm just not sure that I want to deal with the drama. <laughs> <laughs> I hear you. Yeah, I definitely know all about that. I was, uh, I was at Prototypes. So that oh. was where I did my my rehab, and that you stick a bunch of women in in a building, and it gets interesting. That's for sure. <laughs> so, well, offline, I might see. You probably met my sister there then, um, and I'm from, I'm familiar with prototypes because we sold the house directly behind prototypes, which is yeah, uh, okay, yeah, uh, the Phil Barn, and they bought it from, and they do 26 weddings a year there. Wow. Yeah. Go. Yeah. I saw that. I think I, I saw that uh, when I was there. So, oh my gosh, it's incredible. So for my, my last question to you. So obviously, like I said, you've had 11 DUIs. That's crazy. Um, I know a lot of the, a lot of people right now, DUI seems to be the biggest reason people are at meetings or they're court ordered. Um, right. And it's, it's kind of gotten out of control to where people are just drinking and driving all day, every day. Um, they're grabbing their, you know, their week, what, what everyone calls a roadie, you know, their roadie mm. where they're, okay. they're taking their drink on the road. And, um, it's just getting so bad that, uh, you know, everyone's, everyone's drinking and driving. And unfortunately it's very dangerous and scary out there. So I've met a lot of people with DUIs, but, um, but yeah, did you have any questions for me? Um, no, but just segueing onto the DUIs, and here's the other thing that um, my sister has left several messages as she is, uh, she left a place called, I think, Genesis, well, Genesis House, yeah. so if you're editing it, but uh, Angela there said she gave her a break because they met in custody, blah, blah, prior to that, she was at a place called Hacienda House. My point is that I also see in her a jealousy and an anger and, and having grown up in the same house and she tells me my childhood, my childhood. And I said, well, I was across the living room. It's <laughs> like, I don't know what two other people raised you. My point is that recently after 11 DUI, spending almost six years in prison, probably about four years in county of different times and probably over a million dollars in fines and lawyers and, and um, bail. I just applied with the DMV about nine months ago, had to do an interview. They wanted to know that I didn't, so one of the instances I passed out at the wheel, so they thought I had seizures. But after 11 DUIs, having my license not restricted or suspended, but revoked for life, I applied and was given my license back. My 11 DUIs have been wiped out because it's been over 10 years, thanks to Matt. And the reality is I just applied for a senior discount and I have a good driver's discount. So, <laughs> so life's good. Life's it good. Like, if it feels like it's not going fast enough, it probably isn't. But the light at the end of the tunnel is if somebody that was literally asked to leave this county and had 11 DUIs can get his license back and get a good driver discount. It takes time. And, um, you know, but it, awesome. anything possible as long as we stay, you know, there, there's nothing that's happened since 2014, Crystal, that a drink would have made any better. Yeah. And that's, you know. Yeah, that's, I mean, I, for me, you know, I'm, I'm almost five months sober and I, it's been, it's been difficult, but it's amazing how awake I am. And that's the biggest thing is it so much, like you said, how, how many people are in jail or they've committed something and they don't even remember what they did. And, and like my last episode was on blackout drinking and it's just incredible. The, the chemical that alcohol is 
how it has a hold on so many people. And yeah. it, it really is helpful to have, you know, people like you, especially who have been through more than I could ever even imagine. And here you are, you know, sitting with a positive attitude, having great things to say, you know, sharing your story, even through the loss of your family and, you know, going to jail and, and all of the things you've you've done and then you're sitting here and you're giving back to the community and you're you know you're you're living your life and you're you're making a memory of your sons and and I just think that's that's really um incredible so you should be proud of yourself for sure because I'm, I'm definitely inspired <laughs> every week that, um, that is really yeah, I mean, I'm, yeah, I'm, I'm trying to, it's brand new. It, uh, to me, it's a, it's an accountability thing. So it's, you know, I just felt like God was leading me in this direction. And so I'm doing it. And um, with that, I'm going to close out. So I just want to say thank you so, so much, John. Um, I will be seeing you around and I just going to do a couple shout outs to some patrons and sponsors. You can sponsor okay. the show or you can become a patron. And I have Chloe from Idaho and and Judy from Florida. And of course, they have to mention my mom because she's just uh, super supportive. So um, with that, uh, as everyone knows, if I can do it, we can do it. So thank you so much, John, and I'll see you all next time. Thank you for having